Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Christianity is not a passive religion. It's not a thing where we just wish and hope. We, we've got it. We pray and we say and we do the part that God's telling us to do. Mark 4, 35, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. <laughs> let us go over to the other side. We all get kind of excited when God initially says something to us that sounds like we're going to make progress. When we receive a promise from him or a word from him. And if we were to skip all the way over to Mark chapter 5, verse 1, It says, and they came to the other side. So, wonderful. Jesus said, let's go. And they arrived. But there's verse 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, and 41 that we have to deal with. <laughs> Before we get to chapter 5, verse 1. That's what I call the middle. And to be honest with you, we live most of the time in the middle. Everybody gets excited about the new thing. Everybody gets excited when they finally arrive and they've reached their goal, but a lot of people never reach their goals. They never get to their destination. They never see their dreams fulfilled. They never experience the fulfillment of the promises of God in their life because they don't know what to do in the middle. So today, I'm going to talk to you about the middle. <laughs> And leaving the throng, verse 36, Mark 4, 36, And leaving the throng, they took him with them, just as he was in the boat in which he was sitting. And there were other boats there also. And a furious storm of wind, of hurricane proportions, arose. <laughs> well, I wasn't thinking that was going to happen. And the waves kept beating into the boat, so that it was already becoming filled. But he was in the stern of the boat, asleep. Now, doesn't it just really frustrate you when you're in a storm and it feels to you like Jesus is asleep. We get kind of frantic, don't we? Like, oh, what, what am I going to do? Now we start trying to figure everything out. We start worrying and we start running to everybody we know for advice. Can I give you a little insight this morning? Most of the people that you're asking how to solve your problem, they don't even know what to do about their own. So try running to the throne, not the phone. <laughs> master, master, don't you care that we're perishing? <laughs> And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush now, be still. And the wind ceased, sank to rest as if exhausted by its beating, and there was immediately a great calm and a perfect peace. And he said to them, Why are you so timid and fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Well, well I have faith. Well, yeah, I mean, well, Jesus, I have faith. I mean... I believe in you. Well, you know, it's one thing to believe in Jesus. It's another thing to learn how to take that faith into your everyday life and let it keep you calm in the storm. Can anybody say amen? amen. You know, I love the sound of joy, and it was so cool this morning watching everybody in worship and some of those songs we were singing, and what a good time everybody was having. And I just thought, what a wonderful sound joy is. That's wonderful. But you know what? We don't want you just to have it in here when all the conditions are perfect. We want you to have that joy when you don't have anything in particular to be joyful about. And joy is not always extreme hilarity and laughing as hard as you can laugh. I love one of the definitions uh, of uh, peace and joy, a calm delight. A calm delight. You know, yesterday afternoon, I took a little nap to rest a little between the, the first and the second session, and 
I was laying in bed just resting. I didn't really sleep that much. And I just, I, I had this thought. I said, you know, Jesus, I just love my life. And that's such a wonderful feeling because for so many years, I didn't like life. I was never satisfied. I didn't like me. I didn't like too many other people. I didn't like anything that was going on. I just was not a happy camper. But, praise God, I went to church. People, somebody interviewed me recently and said, you know, are, 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 you, are you against church and religion? Absolutely not. No, how ridiculous would that be? We have a church in St. Louis. I want people to go to church, and I want you to go to church regularly. That's part of what you need to do. But I don't want you to do it just out of some formalism like you think you're getting a check mark on your God calendar. I want you to go because you want to be there, because you're growing and learning and you're worshiping God, and you fully intend when you walk in, I am going to learn something and I am going to go out and do it. We've got to learn to do it. And the place where we do it is in the storm. It's very easy to do it in here. <laughs> this is no effort. You've got a cushy seat. I've studied to bring you the Word. You got great music. Oh, you, you just, we didn't charge you anything to get in. You're just like. <laughs> just, ah, oh, feed me. But I can tell you, it's not going to be that easy when you get out of here. Stuff, stuff starts happening. Amen? Amen? One of the things that I really enjoy when I'm finished with my preaching in the daytime, I don't do it at night, is a cup of Starbucks coffee. Well, yeah. So, like Tommy Barnett says, thank God for Starbucks till the anointing kicks in. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I even have my own little cup. I've got one of these double-walled cups from Starbucks that keeps it hot for a long, long time. And it's, I like it. It's a copper color. I like that. So got, got the whole thing, you know. And uh, so somebody had got me some coffee and brought it so it would be ready when I went back. We went back, and somebody had stolen my coffee. <laughs> my cup? The cream, everything, <laughs> gone, gone. Well, you know what? I can remember a day when I would have had a fit about that. I mean, an absolute fit. And I would have gotten confused. Oh, God, I'm up there pouring my heart out to these people all morning, and all I want is a little cup of coffee. And... <laughs> what about me and why me? And I don't understand. The devil's always picking on me. I mean, for, for maybe like five seconds, I was aggravated, and then I just laughed. I said, you know what? This is really funny. <laughs> and I said, I feel sorry for whoever stole my coffee. <laughs> now, it's possible that somebody cleaning up back there, they just thought they were being tidy and threw it away. I don't know how you'd throw away a whole brand new mug of coffee, but you know, people think differently. So after about five more minutes, I decided to believe the best, like the Bible says. <laughs> Amen. So there's always stuff going on in life. There's always the storm. And it's one thing to stand up here and preach it. It's another thing for you to sit and listen to it, but we got to go out and live it. Live it. And most of the time, Whatever I preach, I'm tested on. And most of the time, whatever you hear. Anybody ever notice that? You'll be tested on. The Bible says when the seed is sown into your heart, the devil comes immediately <laughs> to try to steal the seed that was sown. And I think one of the ways that he does it is by very simply testing you on what you just heard. And we need, we need to get it. Learn a new sentence. This is only a test. 
Can we practice? Say, this is only a test. Amen. So, the storm. And Jesus said, why are you acting like that? Where's your faith? It takes more than just faith that Jesus died for you to get through this world victoriously. It takes more than that. And I believe that we have an obligation to God to learn how to live in victory while we're here because we are the Jesus that people are looking at. We're his witnesses. We're his ambassadors. He's appealing to the world through us. And they don't want a bunch of sad, sour, broken down, pitiful, pathetic religion. They want to see people that have got victory, have got joy, have got peace, that are loving people. And they were all filled with great awe and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, well, who is this man that even the wind obeys him? And then they came to the other side. Let's look at John 14, 27. I want you all to make a decision this morning before we go any further at all in this message. Jesus has left us a legacy. Any loving person, when they die, they usually like to leave something to their loved ones, and Jesus has left us a legacy. And it includes many things, but one of the last things that he talked about leaving us is recorded in John 14, 27, and he says, peace I leave with you. My own peace I now give and bequeath unto you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Now watch this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. <laughs> Neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. <laughs> well, I can't help it. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. So, before you're going to have peace, you're going to have to make some decisions about some things. And the first decision you have to make is, I am unwilling to live without peace. I will not live without peace. You see, I spent way too much of my life in turmoil. And maybe 15 years ago, I made a decision that I was going to have peace and I was going to have joy and I was going to have righteousness. Because that's the kingdom. That I was not going to spend the rest of my life feeling guilty every time I made some little minor mistake. Obviously, we're going to be sorry for the things that we do wrong. But Jesus has provided a way for us to be forgiven. And he says there's no condemnation to those in Christ. Condemnation is a total waste of time. It doesn't help you behave better. It just keeps you stuck where you're at. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And I decided instead of just singing songs about the kingdom, I was actually going to try to live in it. Amen? I decided. God has provided wonderful things for you, but you have to decide that you're going to have them and that you are not going to let any person on earth or any devil in hell take them away from you. You must make a decision today. And here comes the bad news. The good news is Jesus provided peace. The bad news is you're going to have to make an effort. Let's look at it again. Peace I leave with you. Because see, here's the thing. Oh God, I pray that you'd give me peace. <laughs> I wish I had peace. You don't really even need to pray for peace. To be honest, you just need to thank God that you've got it. Because he says right here, you've already got it. I think we ask for a lot of stuff that we ought to be recognizing that we have and thanking God for it. And then that, that attitude of faith will actually release that thing out of our spirit into our soul. Oh, God, give me peace. God, give me peace. Peace, peace, peace. God, I can't stand it. No. Thank you, God, that I have peace. Give me the grace to walk in this peace. Help me see what I'm doing that's keeping me all aggravated and stirred up, show me what I need to do and give me the grace to do it. You never do it on your own. You got to lean on him all the time. But I finally decided I am not going to spend the rest of my life without peace. Well, one of the things that you're going to have to learn to do if you want to have peace is learn how to not worry. Not worry. 
Worry is making a down payment on a problem you may never have. <laughs> Worry is a total, complete, useless waste of time. Worry never solves your problem. <laughs> All it does is torture you. It torments you. And it has nothing to do with faith. I can't help it. I'm just a worrier. No, you have peace. I said you have peace. And you have power. I have peace and I have power. Therefore, I am not going to live in worry. Now, I like to be really practical about stuff. And so I know it's not going to do me much good to say go home and don't worry unless I can maybe help you understand why you worry. And the only thing that I can come to, the couple of reasons why we worry, and that is, number one, we actually still really think that we can solve our problem. <laughs> we don't get it yet. That we can't do it. God's not going to let us do it because He wants us to lean on Him and rely on Him. Now, there are things that we can do and should do, and those are what we should do. But the minute you start going beyond that, you're going to get frustrated and aggravated. As soon as you start trying to do something about something you can't do anything about, like, for example, trying to change people. I mean, how many of you, let's just talk to the ladies for a minute. How many of you ladies have just frustrated yourself long enough trying to change your husband? Has it worked? Well, then just isn't it kind of dumb to keep doing the same thing over and over and over? <laughs> You're not changing him. Matter of fact, I found out the more I tried to change Dave, the worse it got. <laughs> He'd just ramp it up to another level. Because <laughs> you see, people don't want to be put under the law. The law increases sin. So the more you try to make somebody do something, Pretty much the way the flesh reacts is the more determined they are that they're not going to. And the thing is, is even if you get them to stop that thing until the heart is changed, it's going to show up somewhere else. It's like one of those whack-a-mole games, you know, you, and it comes up over here and then you, and it comes up over here and there it is again. Only God can get inside of a person and change the heart, the heart, amen. And I can give you some good news, though. I don't know how long you've been married, but I've been married 43 years. And uh, to one man. <laughs> and, oh, man, I tell you, in the last, I don't know, maybe eight, nine years, it's just gotten so easy. I mean, I'm just like, do whatever you want to do. <laughs> Because I'm staying peaceful. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Amen? I mean, Dave and I just hardly ever have a problem anymore because I finally got it. I about killed myself before I did. <laughs> I was about ready for the funny farm, but I finally got it. Only God can change people. And I guess if God doesn't like the way he is, then God can tell him and change it. And he takes the same attitude toward me. I have four children. They're all different. So different. It's like, how could you all have come out of the same place? I just don't get it. <laughs> and you see different ones of them doing things, and you think, oh, man, don't do that. Don't. Ooh. And we want to tell them, how many of you have noticed, especially if you have grown children, telling them something, they're like, mother? <laughs> I am 30 years old. <laughs> so we're worrying about the spouse. We're worrying about the kids. We're worrying about the grandkids. We're worrying about the world. We're worrying about everything we do wrong. We worry, we worry, we worry. And all you're doing is just making yourself miserable. Actually, you can... You can actually make yourself sick with worry. Worry can cause 
stomach problems, give people ulcers, can cause colon problems, give you headaches, nervous tension, makes you irritable. It creates a lot of stress and cancer is known to be connected to stress. Causes loss of sleep, loss of focus. You begin to, you can't focus on what you're supposed to focus on because you're so worried about everything. So now you start forgetting things and losing things. And <laughs> I got a witness in here today, let me tell you. And you know, I just think you need to have a little Holy Ghost fit and you need to say, I am not going to worry anymore. <laughs> and the minute, and I'm telling you, you may have to fight a fight. Because the minute you decide you're not going to worry, the devil will probably give you 20 new things to worry about. So you're going to have to make some declarations. You did not understand me, devil. I am not going to live in worry. Take your best shot, but I am not going to live in worry. See, I hope I can get you to understand that Christianity is not a passive religion. It's not a thing where we just wish and hope. And we, we've got it. We pray and we say and we do the part that God's telling us to do. Come on, some of you, if you will just change your attitude, your life can do a 360 degree turn. If you'll just say, I am not smart enough to solve this. I, me, ma, I am not smart enough to solve this. I do not know what to do. And when people say, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You say, I don't have a clue. <laughs> don't know, but I know somebody who does know. And I guess he'll tell me when he's good and ready. Listen to the definition of worry. This is the definition that I got. I didn't make it up. I got this. I forget now because I've had it a long time. But to torment oneself with disturbing thoughts. <laughs> Does anybody here have enough sense to not torment your own self? <laughs> well, what are you doing today? Tormenting myself. <laughs> yes, I just thought I'd spend the day making myself completely, totally miserable. <laughs> To torment oneself with disturbing thoughts, to feel uneasy, anxious, or troubled, to torment with annoyances, cares, and anxieties, to seize by the throat, take into the teeth, and shake or mangle. <laughs> the Bible says that worry and the cares and the anxieties of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, chokes the word. Spend all that time that you're spending worrying, meditating on the word of God. Fight the good fight. Get out your Bible and start saying some stuff out loud. Your own voice will disrupt the wrong thoughts you're having. You'll believe more of what you say than what anybody else says. Make a decision you're not going to live in worry. Humans are the only species of creation that worries. And we are supposed to be the most intelligent. We're like the cream of the crop. Everybody else gets it. Trees don't worry. <laughs> Birds don't worry. Rabbits don't worry. Flowers don't worry. Lions don't worry. Pigs don't worry. Cows don't worry. Oh, but us smart ones, the wise bunch, the intelligent group, we worry. Nobody else worries. Matthew 25. Or Matthew 6, I'm sorry. The practicality of how not to worry. Learn how to get some humility. Learn what you can do and what you can't do. <laughs> do what God tells you to do, but stay away from trying to do anything He didn't tell you to do. Do what you can do. God will do what you can't do. Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious, and worried about your life. The next time you start to worry, just have a little talk with yourself and say, all right, stop it. Right now, just stop it. Talk to yourself. Say, this is not going to do any good. 
I've been there, done that. I'm not going to waste this day tormenting myself and making myself miserable, thinking about this thing over and over and over. God, I cast it on you. I give it to you. And then you know what you should do? Go get involved in something else that'll take your, your time and your mind, something that's going to be happy, something that's going to be helpful, something that's going to be joyful and peaceful. Well, as we talked about today, when we step out in faith, we always have a beginning and hopefully we have an end, but it's really what happens in the middle that makes all the difference in the world. And the reason I say hopefully we have an end is because if we don't make the right decisions in the middle of our faith or while we're waiting to see the fulfillment of the promises of God, then many people turn back and never get to the end of their dreams and their visions. And so I really want to encourage you in the midst of Whatever you're doing, you're believing God, but cast your care on Him and believe that if you'll just keep doing what you know that you should do day after day after day after day, you're going to get to the end and it's going to be beautiful. I love to say that it's not what we do once that gives us a good result. It's what we do right over and over and over and over again. So maybe you're watching today and you feel like you've been trying to do what's right, but you're getting a little weary. Well, the Bible says, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. 